Hi, my name is Johan, and we're reading a book about thinking fast and slow. Uh, it's written by, what is who's written by? Uh, let me see, who the hell wrote this book? Oh, there it is. Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman. I hope I'm saying that right. Sorry if that's what it is. It sucks. So the book is about... There's a lot of comments on it, so the back doesn't give you an exact idea of what the book's about. So I'm going to start reading the introduction. This is the first video, and then obviously there will be more books. And so, But I'm going to do video by chapter by chapter. So this will be the introduction chapter, and then I'll go to the next video and read the first chapter. So that's how this these videos are going to go. So hopefully enjoy them. And enjoy my beautiful face while you while I read to you. And maybe this will help you sleep, or maybe this will help you learn about life. So this is what Marin's reading is about. My name is Yvonne. I hope you enjoy this. And uh, let us begin the introduction. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I got you. Never mind. Uh, every author, I suppose, has in mind a setting in which readers of his or her work could benefit from having read it. Mine is the proverbial office water cooler where opinions are shared and gossip is exchanged. I hope to enrich the vocabulary that people use when they talk about the judgments and choice of others, the company's new policies or colleagues' investment decisions. Why be concerned with gossip? Because it is much easier as well as far more enjoyable to identify and label the mistakes of others than to recognize our own. Questioning what we believe and want is difficult at the best of times. And especially difficult when we most need to do it. Jack, I can relate to that. But we can benefit from the informed opinions of others. Many of us spontaneously anticipate how, how friends and colleagues will evaluate our choices. The quality and content of these anticipated judgments therefore matters. The expectation of intelligent gossip is a powerful motive for serious self criticism, more powerful than New Year resolutions to improve one's decision making at work and at home. To be a good diagnostician, a physician needs to acquire a large set of labels for diseases, each of which binds an idea of the illness and its symptoms. Possible and I don't know how to say this word. My God, antecedent, antecedents, antecedents. Oh my God, butcher me in the comments there. Antecedents. I'm gonna Google this. Give me a second. Antecedents. Antecedents. God, this is the worst word in the world. Antecedents. Yeah, that's what I wrote. That yeah, that's what I didn't catch that. He she didn't catch it, but it says right there. Antecedents. I'm sorry. Fucking hell. Hold on. Give me a second. Give me a second. I don't know that word. Uh antecedents. And how do you freaking say that word? Antecedent. Antecedent. Okay, antecedents. And as it's a thing that existed before or logically precedes another. Write that down. And causes possible developments and con consequences. And possible interventions to, to cure or mitigate the illness. Learning medicine consists in part of learning the language of medicine. A deeper understanding of judgments and choices also requires a richer vocabulary than is available in everyday language. The hope for informed gossip is that there are distinctive patterns in the errors people make. Systematic errors. Systematic, uh, systematic errors are known as biases and they recur predictably in particular circumstances. When the handsome and confident speaker bounce onto the stage, for example, you can anticipate that the audience will judge his comments more favorably than he deserves. So that's an interesting comment. When the handsome and confident speaker bounds onto the stage, for example, you can anticipate that the audience will judge his comments more favorably than he deserves. The availability of diagnostic label for this bias, the halo effect, makes it easier to anticipate, recognize, and understand. When you're asked what you're thinking about, you can normally answer, you believe you know what goes on in your mind, which often consists of one conscious thought leading in an orderly way to another. But that is not the only way to mind, that is not the only way the mind works, nor indeed is that the typical way. 
most impressions and thoughts arise in your conscious experience without knowing how they got there you cannot trace how you came to the belief that there is a lamp on the desk in front of you or how you detected a hint of irritation in your spouse's voice on the telephone or how you managed to avoid a threat on the road before you became consciously aware of it the mental work that produces impressions intuitions and many decisions goes on and goes on in silence in our mind much of the discussion in this book is about biases of intuition however the focus on error does not degenerate human intelligence any more than the attention to diseases in medical text denies good health most of us are healthy most of the time and most of our judgments and actions are appropriate most of the time as we navigate our lives we normally allow ourselves to be guided by impressions and feelings and the confidence we have in our intuitive beliefs and preferences is usually justified but not always we are often confident even when we are wrong and an objective observer is more likely to detect our errors than we are so this is my aim for water cooler conversations improve the ability to identify and understand errors of judgment and choice improve the ability to identify and understand errors of judgment and choice okay that's an interesting and others even eventually in ourselves by providing let me read that whole thing again blah 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 blah, blah, blah. so this is my aim for water cooler conversations improve the ability to identify and understand errors of judgment and choice and others even in eventually ourselves oh my god i said that wrong my god you sick bastard so this is my aim for water cooler conversations improve the ability to identify and understand errors of judgment and choice in others and eventually in ourselves by providing a richer and more precise language to discuss them in at least some cases an accurate diagnosis may suggest an intervention to limit the damage that bad judgments and choice and often cause origins the book presents my current understanding of judgment and decision making which has been shaped by psychological discoveries of recent decades however i trace the central ideas to the lucky day in 1969 when i asked a colleague to speak as a guest to a seminar i was teaching in the department of psychology at the hebrew university of jerusalem amos tversky was considered a rising star in the field of decision research indeed in anything he did so i knew he would have an interesting time many people who knew amos thought he was the most intelligent person they had ever met he was brilliant, voluble, and charismatic. He was also blessed with a perfect memory for jokes and an exceptional ability to use them to make a point. There was never a dull moment when Amos was around. He was then 32, I was 35. Amos told the class about an ongoing program of research at the University of Michigan that sought to answer this question. Are people good intuitive statisticians? We already knew that people are good intuitive grammarians Grammary, grammarians at age four a child perfectly conforms to the rules of grammar as she speaks although she has no idea that the such rules exist do people have uh, do people have a similar intuitive feel for the basic principles of statistics amos reported that the answer was a qualified yes we had lively we had a lively debate in the seminar and ultimately concluded that a qualified no was a better answer Emma and I enjoyed the exchange and concluded that intuitive statistics was an interesting topic and that it would be fun to explore together. That Friday we met for lunch at a cafe, Rimon, the favorite hangout of bohemians and professors in Jerusalem, and planned a study of the statistical intuitions of sophisticated researchers. We had concluded in the seminar that our own intuitions were def deficient. Oh my God, there's another word we don't know. Uh, dun, 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 dun. That's a really weird word. Deficient meaning not having enough or de deficient. You dumb fucking idiot. All right, let's go back to that part. Deficient idiot. Jesus Christ. Oh my God! Okay, where was I? He was brilliant. Blah blah. I must have kind of lost myself here. 
three the people do the and enjoy the exchange. Okay, I'm gonna start here. Amos and I enjoyed the exchange and concluded that the intuitive statistic was an interesting topic and that it would be fun to explore together. Am I sure to go? Oh, what the fuck? Ah, I found it. I found it. We had concluded in the same that our own intuitions were deficient. In spite of years of teaching and using statistics, we had not developed an intuitive sense of the reliability of statistical results observed in small samples. Our subjective judgments were biased. We were far too willing to believe research findings based on inadequate evidence and prone to collect too few observations in our own research. The goal of our study was to examine whether other researchers suffered from the same affliction. We prepared a survey that included realistic scenarios of statistical issues that arise in research. Amos collected the responses of a group of expert participants in a meeting of the Society of Mathematical Psychology, including the authors of two statistical textbooks. As expected, we found that our expert colleagues like us greatly exaggerated the likelihood that the original result of an experiment would be successfully replicated even with a small sample. They also gave very poor advice to a fictitious graduate student about the number of observations she needed to collect. Even statisticians were not good intuitive statisticians. <laughs> While writing the article that reported these findings, Amos and I discovered that we enjoyed working together. Did I say that right? Oh my God. Amos and I discovered that we enjoyed working together. Amos was always very fun, funny. <clears throat> and in his presence, I became funny as well. So we spent hours of solid work and continuous amusement. The pleasure we found in working together made us exceptionally patient. It is much easier to strive for perfection when you're never bored. Perhaps most important, we checked our critical weapons at the door. Both Amos and I were critical and argumentative. He even more than I, but during the years of our collaboration, neither of us ever rejected out of hand anything the other said. Indeed, one of the great joys I found in the collaboration was that Amos frequently saw the point of my vague ideas much more clearly than I did. Amos was the more logical thinker with an orientation to theory and an unfailing sense of direction. I was more intuitive and rooted in the psychology of perception from which we borrowed many ideas. We were sufficiently similar to understand each other easily and sufficiently different to surprise each other. We developed a routine in which we spent much of our working days together, often on long walks. For the next 14 years, our collaboration was the focus of our lives and the work we did together during those years, and it was the best either of us ever did. We quickly adopted a practice that we maintained for many years. Our research was a conversation in which we invented questions and jointly examined our intuitive answers. Each question was a small experiment and we carried out many experiments in a single day. We were not seriously looking for the correct answer to the statistical question we posed. Our aim was to identify and analyze the intuitive answer, the first one that came to mind, the one we were tempted to make even when we knew it to be wrong. We believe correctly, as it happened, that any intuition that the two of us shared would be shared by many other people as well, and that it would be easy to demonstrate its effects on a, effects on judgments. So let me just say that sentence again. And that it would be easy to demonstrate its effect on judgments. Effects on judgments. I'm going to say that one more time. Never mind. Whatever, let's keep on going. We once discovered with great delight that we had identical silly ideas about the future professions of several toddlers we both knew. We could identify the argumentative three-year-old lawyer, the nerdy professor, the empathetic and mildly intrusive psychotherapist. Of course, these predictions were absurd, but we still found them appealing. It was also clear that, that our intuitions were governed by the resemblance of each child to the cultural stereotype of a profession. The amusing exercise helped us develop a theory that was emerging in our minds at the time about the role of resemblance and predictions. We went on to test and elaborate, elaborate that theory in dozens of experiments as in the following example. As you consider the next question, please assume that Steve was selected at random from a representative sample. 
An individual has been described by a neighbor as follows. Steve is very shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful, but with little interest in people or in the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul, he was a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? I'm going to guess he's a farmer because he's dirty. No, I'm kidding. That's a terrible answer. But let's go for farmer. I'm going for farmer I'm, because I'm reading this and it seems like that's the best option, right? Let's do this. The resemblance of Steve's personality to that of a stereotypical librarian strikes everyone immediately. Not me. Oh. But equally relevant statistical considerations are almost always ignored. Did it occur to you that there are more than 20 male farmers for each male librarian in the United States? Nope, did not know that. Because there are so many more farmers, it's almost certain that more meek and tidy souls will be found on tractors than at a library information desk. However, we found that participants in our experiments ignored the relevant statistical facts and relied exclusively, exclusively on resemblance. We proposed that they used resemblance as a simplifying heuristic, roughly a rule of thumb, to make a difficult judgment. The reliance on the heuristic caused predictable biases, systematic errors in, the, in their predictions. Again, on another occasion, Amos and I wondered about the rate of divorce among professors in our university. We noticed that the question triggered a search of memory for divorced professors we knew or knew about and that we judge the size of categories by the ease with which instance came in, sorry, with which instance with which instances came to mind. We call this reliance on the case of memory. No, sorry, I'm reading that. I need my glasses. Just give me a second. Oh, oh such a blind soul. Oh, hello, beautiful. Let's speak So, the, oh, here we are. So, we noticed that the question triggered a search of memory for divorced pre professors we knew or knew about, and then we judged the size of categories by the ease with which instances came to mind. We called this reliance on the case of, again, we called this the reliance on the ease of memory search the availability heuristic in one of our studies. We asked participants to answer simple questions about words in typical English text. Consider the letter K. Is K more likely to appear as the first letter in a word or as the third letter? As any Scrabble player knows, it is much easier to come up with words that begin with a particular letter than to find words that have the same letter in the third position. This is true for every letter of the alphabet. We therefore expected respondents to exaggerate the frequency of letters appearing in the first position. Even those letters, such as K, L, N, R, V, which in fact occur more frequently in the third position, here again the, rely uh, the reliance on a heuristic pro produces a predictable bias in judgments. These are hefty words for one man. For example, I re recently came to doubt my long-held impression that adultery is more common among politicians than among physicians or lawyers. I'd even come up with explanations for the fact, including the aphrodisiac effect of power and the temptations of life away from home. I eventually realized that the transgressions of politicians are much more likely to be reported. Hold on, there's another page. Most are much more likely to be reported than transgress transgressions of lawyers and doctors. That's actually a good point. I mean, if you look at it, like politicians, like, what do they do? I mean, they're always online, and so there's no one else to research but them. So if you think about it, you know, it does make sense that if you put yourself in the limelight, everyone's going to kind of research you and figure you, who you are, what you do, why you like that. It does make sense. And usually you won't see a lawyer who's, you know, reported or actually in general, like everybody's job. No one's fucking researching you because no one knows you, right? So... In fact, every time someone researches you, you're good, you're bad, you're ugly, whatever you got, you're, you're in the light. So, yeah, it's a pretty interesting fact. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's it. My intuitive impression could be due to entirely to journalists' choices of topics and to my reliance 
on the availability of availability, uh, availability heuristic. Amos and I spent several years studying and documenting biases of intuitive thinking in various tasks, assigning probabilities to events, forecasting the pick the forecasting the future, assessing hypotheses, and estimating frequencies. In the fifth year of our collaboration, we processed our main findings in Science Magazine and publication read by scholars in many disciplines. The article, which is reproduced in full in the end of this book, was titled Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristic and Biases. It described the simplifying shortcuts of intuitive thinking and explained some 20 biases as manifestations of these heuristics, and also as demonstrations of the role of heuristics in judgment. Historians of science have often noted that any given time, scholars in a particular field tend to share basic assumptions about their subject. Social sciences are no exception. They rely on view of human nature that provides the background of most discussions of specific behaviors, but is rarely questioned. Social sciences in the 1970s broadly accepted two ideas about, about human nature. First, people are generally rational and their thinking is normally sound. Second, emotions such as fear, affection, and hatred explain most of the occasions on which people depart from rationality. Whoa, that's pretty cool. We document systematic areas in the thinking of normal people, and we trace these areas to the design of the machinery of cognition rather than to the corruption of thought by emotion. I can actually relate to that. That's an interesting topic because every time I get angry, you know, or... I mean, I mean, all types of emotions. Like if you're too happy, maybe you don't want to do something or you want to do something else. Or you're angry and you want to hit someone and you need strength to do it. it, it it's, it's an interesting concept because everything you do in life, even though you know what the right answer is, you do it based on feeling. And I feel like I can relate to this because I do it kind of every day. But it's interesting. There's other ways. I think you could do. I can. Every, I think everybody could deal with that type of um, feeling. It just depends on habit and your routine. Because as I think, we are extremely we extremely uh, repetitive beings. Even though, so you go keep on going up and down. Which is anyway back to the book. Our article attracted much more attention than we had expected, and it remains one of the most highly cited works in social science. More than 300 scholarly articles referred to it in 2010. Scholars in other disciplines found it useful, and the ideas of heuristic and biases have been used productively in many fields, including medical diagnosis, legal judgment, intelligence analysis, philosophy, finance, statistics, and military strategy. For example, students of policy have noted that the availability of heuristic helps explain why some issues are highly salient in the public's mind while others are neglected. neglected. People tend to access the relative importance of issues by the ease with which they are retrieved from memory. And this is largely, largely determined by the extent of coverage in the media. Frequently mentioned topics populate the mind even as others slips away from awareness. In turn, what the media choose to report corresponds to their view of what is currently on the public's mind. I mean, dude social media bro jesus every day that kind of makes sense it really does it's no accident that the author authoritarian reg regimes exert substantial pressure on ind independent media because public interest is most easily aroused by dramatic events and by celebrities media feeding frenzies are common for several weeks after michael jackson's death for example it was virtually impossible to find a television channel reporting on another topic in contrast, there's a title coverage of critical but unex what does it say? unexciting issues that provide less drama, such as declining educational standards or overinvestment of medical resources in the last year of life. As I write this, I noticed that my choice of little covered examples was guided by availability. The topics I chose as examples or mentioned often equally important issues that are less available did not come to mind. We did not fully realize it at the time, but a key reason for the broad appeal of heuristic and biases outside psychology was an incidental feature of our work. We almost always include in our articles the full text of the questions we had asked ourselves and our, whoa, 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 whoa slow down, you are just talking too fast. We almost always included in our articles the full text of the questions we had asked ourselves and our respondents. These questions served as a demonstration for the reader allowing him to recognize how his own thinking was stripped up by cognitive biases. I hope you had such an experience as you read the question about Steve, the librarian, which was intended to help you appreciate the power of resemblance as a cue to probability and to see how easy 
it is to ignore relevant statistical facts. The use of demonstration provided scholars from diverse dis uh, disciplines, notably philosophers and economists, as economists. <coughs> Sorry, this is getting dry in my throat because I'm talking so much. The use of demonstrations provided scholars from diverse dis disciplines, notably philosophers and economists, an unusual opportunity to observe possible flaws in their own thinking. Having seen themselves fail, they became more likely to question the dogmatic assumption prevalent, prevalent at the time. Oh my god, this is so hard. Just give me a second. <coughs> Jesus. I need water. Oh my god. Oh. Alrighty. <clears throat> that was intense. Uh, let's go back to normal. Where were we? I hope you had such an experience with blah, 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 blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, the use of demonstration provided to scholars from diverse disciplines, notably, notably philosophers and economists, an unusual opportunity to observe possible flaws in their own thinking. Having seen themselves fail, they became more likely to question the dogma dogmatic assumption Pre uh, prevalent at the time that the human mind is rational and logical. The choice of method was crucial. If we had reported results of only conventional experiments, the article would have been less noteworthy and less memorable. Interesting. Further, more skeptical readers would have distanced themselves from the results by attributing judgment errors to the familiar feckleness, fec sorry, not fecklessness, fecklessness of undergraduates, the typical participants in psychological studies. Of course, we did not choose. Uh, of course, we did not choose demonstrations over standard experiments because we wanted to influence philosophers and economists. I don't know how do you say economists? Economists, economists depends on the country. We preferred demonstrations because they were more fun, and we were lucky in our choice of method as well as in many other ways. A recurrent theme in of this book is that luck plays a large role in every story of success. It is almost always easy to identify a small change in the story that would have turned a remarkable achievement into a mediocre outcome. Our story was no exception. The reaction of uh, the reaction to our work was not uniformly positive. In particular, our focus on biases was criticized as suggesting an unfairly negative view. Mind. As expected in normal science, some investigators refined our ideas and others offered plausible alternatives. By and large, though, the idea is that our minds are susceptible to systematic errors is now generally accepted. Our research on judgment had far more effect on social science than we thought possible when we were working on it. This is really this is a hard book to talk about. Immediately after completing our review of judgment, we switched our attention to decision making under, uncer under uncertainty. Our goal was to develop a psychological theory of how people make decisions about simple gambles. For example, would you accept a bet on the toss of a coin where you win $130 if the coin shows heads and lose $100 if it shows tails? Mm, I would totally fucking take that. That sounds good, man. These, ele these elementary choices had long been used to examine broad questions about decision making, such as the relative weight that people assign to sure things and to uncertain outcomes. Our method did not change. We spent many days making up the choices, uh, up making up the choice problems, and examining whether our intuitive preferences conform to the logic of choice. Here again, as in judgment, we observed systematic biases in our own decisions, intuitive preferences that co consistently violated the rules of rational choice. Five years after the science article, we published Prospect Theory. Five years of the, after the science article, we published. Prosperity theory, an analysis of decision under risk, a theory of choice that is by some counts more influential than our work on judgment, and is one of the foundations of behavioral economics. Until geographical separation made it too difficult to go on, Amos and I enjoyed the extraordinary good fortune of shared mind that was a superior to our individual minds and of a relationship that made our fun as well as made our made our work fun as well as productive. 
Our collaboration on judgment and decision making was the reason for the Nobel Prize that I received in 2002, which Amos would have shared had he not died aged 59 in 1996. Where are we now? The book is not intended as an exposition of early research that Amos and I conducted together, a task that has been ably carried out by many authors over the years. My main aim here is to present a view of how the mind works that draws on recent developments in cognitive and social psychology. One of the more important developments is that we now understand the marvels as well as the flaws of intuitive thought. Amos and I did not address the accurate intuitions beyond the casual statement and judgment. Oh, uh, uh, shit! I fucked up. Amos and I did not address accurate intuition beyond the casual statement that judgment heuristics are quite useful, but sometimes lead to severe and systematic errors. We focused on biases both because we found them interesting in their own right and because they provided evidence for the heuristic of judgment. We did not ask ourselves whether all intuitive judgment under, uns, under uncertainty are produced by the heuristics we study. It is now clear that they are not. In particular, the accurate intuitions of experts are better explained by the effects of prolonged practice than by heuristics. We can now draw a richer and more balanced picture. Am I saying heuristics right? Hu did I say heuristics? Heuristics? Yeah, I said. We can now draw a richer and more balanced picture in which skills and heuristics are alternative sources of intuitive judgment and choices. I hope I'm bloody saying, I'm gonna actually Google this. Uh, so let me read that sentence and I'll look at, we can now draw a richer and more balanced picture in which skills and heuristics are, are alternative sources of intuitive judgments and choices. God, give me a second. Heuristics. I'm gonna... Heuristic. Heuristic. Okay, well, I'm saying, what if I put heuristics? Heuristic. It doesn't have a plural or whatever it is. Not a plural. Yeah, it is. You decide, English people. My English teacher will kill me for this. The psychologist of Gary Klein tells the story of a team of firefighters that entered a house in which the kitchen was on fire. Soon after they started hosing down the kitchen, the commander heard himself shout, Let's get out of here without realizing why. The floor collapsed almost immediately after the firefighters escaped. Only after the fact that they are only after the fact that the commander realized that the fire had been unusually quiet, and that his ears had been unusually hot. Together, these impressions prompted that we call the sixth sense of danger. He had no idea what was wrong, but he knew something was wrong. It turned out that the heart of the fire had not been in the kitchen, but in the basement beneath where the men had stood. We have all heard such stories of expert intuition. The chess master who walks past the street game and announces white meats in three without stopping. Or the physician who makes a complex diagnosis after a single glance at a patient. Expert intuition strikes us as magical, but it is not. Indeed, each of us performs feat of intuitive expertise many times each day. Most of us are pitch perfect in detecting anger in the first word of telephone call. So in the first word of a telephone call. <clears throat> in the first word of a telephone call, recognize as we enter a room that we were the subject of the conversation. Oh shit, you have been have you guys ever done that? And quickly react to subtle signs that the drive of the car in the next lane is dangerous. I mean I've done that. Where you come in, right? Hey, the teacher's talking or a, or a, your parents or your friends and you come in and it's just like awkward. Like it's silent and that's the worst because you don't even freaking know man if this is like uh if this is like a, like a bad thing like maybe they're joking about you which is totally fine man who fucking cares people talk about you know other people behind their backs all the time but like i said like there are some times where it's just like really awkward and you're like what the fuck is going on anyway our everyday intuitive abilities are no less marvelous than the striking insights of an experienced firefighter or physician, only more common. The psychology of accurate intuition involves no magic. Perhaps the best short statement of it is by the great Herbert Simon, who studied chess masters and showed that after thousands of hours of practice, they come to see the pieces on the board differently from the rest of us. You can feel Simon's impatience with the mythologizing, 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 eh? Mythologizing. Uh, of expert intuition when he writes the situation has provided a cue this cue has given the expert access to information stored in memory and the information provides the answer 
Intuition is nothing more and nothing less than the recognition. We are not surprised when a two-year-old looks at a dog and says, doggy, because we are used to the miracle of children learning to recognize and name things. But there is something interesting about that where, like, if you think about it, here's, I think that's a good example where if you've ever driven or ride on a bicycle or you walked, that's better, and you go to some place, right? And you go left, then right, then left, then right, then straight, then down. And the images that kind of help you go through that is kind of an interesting thing because you, you, I think your brain kind of creates neurons every time, you know, every second or whatnot, every, every time you're learning. So there must be a case because every time you go and learn new directions, you, lock, you kind of weirdly find your way, you know, to the right place. And I think that has to do with our intu intuition of like, go, you know, going left, because it's easy to learn going left and right, straight, down, up, you know, directions, because that information is very tiny and small when, when we actually, you know, record that. So, and in our image, we can actually like remember the images when like, for instance, you need to go from bus to train. The first time, you know, you kind of like, oh, kind of weird about it, you don't know, how to get there so you kind of figure out then you learn via mistakes or you just learn and you get there by accident and then the second time which is or third because sometimes in the second time you're like wait did we go left or go right because obviously you weren't paying attention or you lose focus right so it would make sense on the third time or the fourth time or if you, how tired or whatever you are just let's say for the third time you kind of figure it out like you remember which way to go back and forth, right? So that's an interesting thing because like chess masters go left, they go right, they go up, they know which means if this happens and this happens and this happens if this happens. So I think that's an interesting concept here that they produce. Anyway, back to the book. <clears throat> Simon's point is that the miracles of expert intuition have the same character. Valid intuitions develop when experts have learned to recognize familiar elements in a new situation and to act in a manner that is appropriate to it. Good intuitive judgments come to mind with the same immediacy as doggy. Unfortunately, professionals' intuitions do not all arise from true expertise. Many years ago, I visited the chief investment officer of a large financial firm who told me that he had just invested some tens of millions of dollars in the stock of Ford Motor Company. When I asked how he had made that decision, he replied that he had recently attended an automobile show and had been impressed. Boy, do they know how to make a car, was, was his explanation. He made it very clear that he trusted his gut feeling and was satisfied with him himself and with his decision. I found, it I found it remarkable that he had apparently not considered the one question that an economist would call relevant. Is Ford stock currently underpriced? Instead, he listened to his intuition. He liked the cars, he liked the company, he liked the idea of owning it stock, owning, his, uh, owning the stock. From that, we know about the accuracy of the stock picking. It is reasonable to believe that he, don't, he did not know what he was doing. The specific heuristics that Amos and I studied provided little help in understanding how the executive came to invest in Ford stock, but a broader conception of heuristics now exists, which offers a good account. An important advance in that emotion now looms much larger in our understanding of intuitive judgments and choices than it did in the past. The executive decision would today be described as an example of the effect of heuristic, where judgment and decisions are guided directly by feelings of liking and disliking, with little deliberation or reasoning. Now, you know what? I actually want to throw this freaking thing away. It kind of irritates in the video. Just give me a second. Oh. Bingo, we did it. When confronted with a problem, choosing a chess move or deciding whether to invest it in a stock, the machinery of intuitive thought does the best it can. If the individual, uh, sorry, I'm gonna burp now. Give me a sec. If the individual, okay, we got a little left. Um, I'm just gonna check. Okay, I almost done the introduction. This is great news. So I'm gonna stop from beginning, sorry guys. When confronted with the problem choosing a chess move or deciding whether to invest in a stock, the machinery of intuitive thought does the best it can. 
If the individual has relevant expertise, she will recognize the situation and the intuitive solution that comes to her mind is likely to be correct. This is what happens when a chess master looks at a complex position. The few moves that immediately occur to him are all strong. When the question is difficult and a skilled solution is not available, intuition still has a shot. An answer may come to mind quickly, but it is not the answer to the original question. The question that the executive faced, should I invest in Ford stock, was difficult. But the answer to an easy and related question, do I like Ford cars, came readily to his mind and determined his choice. Whoa. This is the essence of intuitive heuristics. When faced with a difficult question, we often answer an easier one instead, usually without noticing the substitution. The spontaneous search for an intuitive solution sometimes fails, neither an expert solution nor a heuristic answer comes to mind. In such cases, we often find ourselves switching to a slower, more deliberate and a more deliberate and effortful form of thinking. This is the slow thinking of the title. Fast thinking includes both variants of intuitive thought, the expert and the heuristic, as well as the entirely automatic mental activities of perception and memory. The operations that enable you to know where there is a lamp on your desk or retrieve the name of the capital of Russia. This distinction between fast and slow thinking has been explored by many, psycholo by many psychologists over the last 25 years. For reasons that I explain more fully in the next chapter, I described mental I describe mental life by the metaphor of two agents called System 1 and System 2, which respectively produce fast and slow thinking. I speak of the futures of intuitive and deliberate thought as if they were traits and dispositions of two characters in your mind. In the picture that emerges from recent research, the intuitive System 1 is more influential than your experience tells you, and it's the secret author of many of the choices and judgments you make. Most of this book is about the workings of System 1 and the mutual influences between, in, between it and, and System 2. What comes next? The book is divided into five parts. Part 1 presents the basic elements of two systems approach to judgment and choice. It elaborates the distinction between the automatic operation of System 1 and the controlled operations of System 2 and shows associated memory the core of System 1 continually constructs a coherent interpretation of what is going on in our world at any instant. I attempt to give a sense of the complexity and richness of the automatic and often unconscious processes that underlie intuitive thinking and of how these automatic processes explain the heuristic of judgment. A goal is to introduce a language for thinking and talking about the mind. Part 2 updates the study of judgment heuristics and explores a major puzzle. Why is it so difficult for us to think statistically? We easily think associatively, we think metaphorically, we think causally, but statistics requires thinking about many things at once, which is something that System 1 is not designed to do. The difficulties of statistical thinking contribute to the main theme of Part 3, which describes a puzzling limitation of our mind, our excessive confidence in what we believe we know, and our apparent inability to acknowledge the full, the, the full extent of our ignorance and the uncertainty of the world we live in. We are prone to overestimate how much we understand about the world and to underestimate the role of chance in events. Overconfidence is fed by the illusory certainty of hindsight. My view on this topic have been influenced by Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan. Oh, whoa. Plot twist. He's reading, fic well, I don't know if it's Black Swan a true story or a fictional. Anyway, I hope for water cooler conversations that intelligently explore the lessons that can be learned from the past while resisting the lure of hindsight and the illusion of certainty. <clears throat> the focus of part four is a is a again Yovan, you got you again. The focus of part four is a conversation with the discipline of economics on the nature of decision making. Oh God, man, what is going on with me today? The focus of part four is a conversation with the discipline of economics on the nature of decision making and on the assumption that economic agents are rational. The section of the book provides a current view in the model of choice that Amos and I... Well, hold on, I fucked up again. Da, 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 da. He fucked up. This section of the book provides a current view informed by a two-system model of, key, of the key concept of prospect theory. The model of choice that Amos and I published in 1975. <clears throat> the subsequent chapter addressed several ways human choices deviate from the rules of rationality. I deal with the unfortunate tendency to treat problems in isolation and with framing effects where, dis where decisions are shaped by inconsequential futures of choice problems. These observations, which are readily explained by the futures of System 1, present a deep challenge, deep challenge 
to the rationality as assumption. Sorry, let me repeat that. That whole sentence is a little bit tongue twister. Tongue twister. Sorry. Observations. Sorry. Uh, these observations, which are readily explained by the features of System One, present a deep challenge to the rationality as uh, to the re rationality assumption favored in standard economics. Sorry, I was looking at the screen weird because this is recorded on my phone, as you can see, and the Instagram noise just went on. So if you wonder why, why did, that, did I look at you so strangely, it's because someone sent me an Instagram message. Weird. Uh, part 5 describes recent research that has introduced a distinction between two selves. The oh, that's interesting. Some fight clubness. All right. The experiencing of self and the remain and the remembering self. Oh, well, that's actually trippy. Which do not have the same interests. So the experiencing self and the remembering self, which do not have the same interests. I think that's a key thing to remember. For example, we can expose people to two painful experiences. One of these experiences is strictly worse than the other because it is longer. But the automatic formation of memories, a future system, one has its rules, which we can exploit so that the worst episode leaves a better memory. Hmm. Well, that's this is interesting. When people later choose which episode to repeat, sorry, let me read that. When people later choose which episode to repeat, they are naturally guided by their remembering self and expose themselves, the experiencing self to unnecessary pain. When people later choose, when people later choose which episode to repeat, they are naturally guided by their remembering self and expose themselves. The experiencing self to unnecessary pain. That's an interesting quote there. Distinction between two selves is applied to the measurement of well being, where we find again that, that what makes the experiencing self happy is not quite the same as what satisfies the remembering self. What the fuck? That's interesting. How two selves within a single body can pursue happiness raises some difficult questions, both for individuals and for societies, that the view. The well, sorry, that view, the well-being of the population as a policy objective. A concluding chapter explores in reverse order the implications of three distinctions drawn in the book between the experiencing and the remembering selves, between the conception of agents in classical economics and in behavioral, and in behavioral economics, which borrows from psychology, and between the automatic system one and the effortful system two. I return virtues of educating gossip and to what organizations might do to improve the quality of judgments and decisions that are made on their behalf. Two articles I wrote with Amos are reproduced as append appendixes to the book. The first is the review of judgment under uncertainty that I described earlier. The second, published in 1984, summarizes prospect theory as well as our studies of framing effects. The articles present the contributions that as our studies of framing, sorry, I'm going to read that again because I just lost myself. I'm at the end, so give me a second. Two articles I wrote with Amos are reproduced as appendixes to the book. The first is the review of judgment under uncertainty that I described earlier. The second, published in 1984, summarized prospect theory as well as our studies of framing effects. The article presents the contributions that were cited by the Nobel Committee, and you may be surprised by how simple they are. Reading them will give you a sense of how much we knew a long time ago, and also of how much we have learned in recent decades. Introduction done. Please leave your comments in the below. In the below. Did you listen to me? Listen to me how stupid I am. Please leave the comments in the below. Oh, God damn. What is wrong with me? Okay, please leave your comments. In, oh. This video is going to be great first video. I'm not going to edit any of this. This is just how the video is going to be straight. Uh, so please leave your uh, ideas and comments below because I think it will be interesting to see what other people think. Uh, I think it's good to, you know, debate these things and I think it's an interesting uh, way to find new answers. You know, scientists may have all the answers in the world sometimes, but sometimes they don't. And some people, you know, can Sometimes people can debate with each other and actually make better ideas than scientists. Even like in any in, in anything, like because there's no creativity within some communities because they become so restricted with rules. So please leave your comments below. I would love to read them and see what you guys think. 
and goodbye. Cheers. Have a good one, guys.